So we are just halfway now through our STEP program. So thank you for those of you who've been joining us throughout the summer. Um, we are currently in one of our transfer talks. If you're not registered for the program, but you found this on our Instagram, um, this QR code just lets you sign up for the other elements, um, which I'll talk about on the coming pages. Simon can also post the link uh, in the chat so that you can sign up for our coming sessions. But we have a lot more going on this summer, so leaving this here for a moment for you to be able to sign up. Today is going to be a session on getting jobs and getting involved. As I mentioned, we only have an hour, so it's going to be pretty quick. And then we'll do a deep dive in our research and involvement series coming very soon. Some of the other things to look forward to in our program are Transfers Connect. So these are going to be an option for you to break through the webinar and have a chance to get to meet our peer coaches, some of our staff and each other, either in Zooms or in person. We are going to have two Connect sessions, three Connect sessions next week, actually. Monday is going to be our one for our undocumented transfer students. Um, that will be Monday, August 5th. We are also going to have um, some support sessions for how to register for classes. We know that's a really hot topic on folks' minds right now. That's going to be next Thursday in person. So we always provide a catered lunch. We'll have some Chipotle make your own bowls and talk about all the steps for signing up for classes. Thursday or Friday um, at 11, we'll do the same thing virtually if you're not someone who's local. We hope that you can join us for either of those sessions. Those are what I just went over. Um, and then additionally, we are gonna have our next week's session on your health at UCSD. So coming up very soon. I'll go ahead and have Elizabeth take it from here, talking about the research and involvement and getting us started on today's topic. Great, thanks so much, Tessa. Hi everybody, welcome to STEP. Um, I know Tessa did an intro, but I'll go ahead and introduce myself one more time. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Vasquez, and my pronouns are she, her, Ea. Um, and I'm full-time staff at the Triton Transfer Hub, and my role is Research and Involvement Coordinator. Um, so in my role, I connect transfer students to research and involvement opportunities on campus. Um, so, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about research and involvement series that starts next week. Um, and in this series, you'll learn a little bit more about how to get involved at UCSD in more detail. And then we're also starting off that series with, um, we'll, we'll have a resume workshop where you can um, get some resume um, supports. And then, yeah, you're going to learn all things research, like how to how to reach out to professors, how to get connected with research labs, how does it work at UCSD, um, what kind of research can you do, research programs. And so I'll get into detail um, a little bit about that in the research and involvement series, but I'll give you a sneak peek um, in the next upcoming slides. And then next slide, please. Um, I did want to talk briefly about the Career Launch Program. So the Triton Transfer Hub um, launched the Career Launch Program for the first time this past spring. And it was a four-week program um, that we had transfer students apply to, if you're interested. In. And um, we had a cohort of about 18 transfer students. And in this program, you received um, activities, a workbook, and then also a lot of like um, videos on career launch. So, and then in this program, transfer students were able to explore career fields. You were also learn, learned how to um, build relationships with professionals and how to network. Um, also launching effective job and internship searches. So sometimes you don't know where to start. And this program also helps a lot of students navigate that. Um, and then overall, just improve self-confidence and career preparation. Um, so we are planning to have this again this upcoming academic year and then more details to come about this application will um, come out in late fall, early winter. So career launch program is something that I would recommend if you need some career prep. All right. Um, yeah, so I wanted to go over about what is experiential learning. So um, experiential learning at UCSD is defined as building bridges between the academic, co-curricular theory and practice by creating opportunities for students to quote unquote learn by doing. Um, and then this definition um, comes from the Experiential Learning Hub, which is part of the Teaching and Learning Commons, um, right? And so likely a lot of you will want to do experiential learning throughout your time at UCSD. And that can be done through internships, research, volunteering, studying abroad, community engagement, entrepreneurship, to name a few 
um, a few things. And really experiential learning is when you are involved in something on campus or off campus, but it helps you um, gain the tools um, and then also gain experience, whether that be for your next step at, after UCSD, whether that be grad school, you know, um, getting involved in research again after graduating or even a, a full-time job. So I kind of wanted to give that intro to what experiential learning means. All right, next slide. Yeah, and so one of the ways that you can get involved with experiential learning is research, and then you can also get paid for research. So I wanted to give you all a sneak peek of a couple of programs that you can get compensated um, with scholarships or a stipend, um, but also do research. So essentially getting paid for research. Um, that first one I have on there is the Learning Aligned Employed Program, also known as LAEP. Um, and this past academic year, they offered students hourly positions. And this past academic year, it was 20 an hour, which is really nice. Um, that second one is the Triton Research and Experiential Learning Scholars Program, also known as TRELS. Um, and they awarded a $1,000 scholarship during the uh, quarter that you did it, whether it was winter or spring. And then in the summer, they offer a $3,000 stipend. Um, but it's more commitment, but you do get compensated for it. And then the UC Scholars Program and the Genentech Scholars Program are sister research programs, meaning that it's one application to apply to both, um, but UC Scholars Program is open to all majors, and then Genentech Scholars is more for students who are interested in a career or research in the biotech field. Um, and then they offer a $3,000 summer stipend. And these um, numbers are from this past academic year. So those are subject to change um, for this upcoming 2024, 2025 academic year. Um, but this is just give you an idea of the type of programs that you can get paid for. And um, yeah, and then you can also, my last point there is you can also receive academic credit for research too. Um, and in the research and involvement series, I go more into detail about these type of programs and more. And then more so about um, as well of how to get academic credit, whether that be for like a major requirement or a college requirement that you might have. Um, so we can talk a little bit about um, how to get academic credit and what are the ways you can get academic credit for research. All right, and so apart from research, another um, option that I will talk about also in our research and involvement series is um, other types of involvement opportunities on campus. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have the Experiential Learning Hub, and through this is housed UCDC, where you can do an internship at Washington DC through UCSD. Um, UC Sacramento, which is also similar, um, you can do an internship and take courses in Sacramento, the capital, um, and then the academic internship program where you can receive academic credit for internships. We also have the study abroad department that also has different types of programs, uh, great programs under them. So they have global exchange, global seminars, UCEAP, whether it's you want to do research abroad, you want to take courses abroad, um, learn a language abroad, or do some major requirements um, while abroad, and it depends when to, if you want to do it for a year, a semester, a quarter, a summer, um, and then where as well. So there's so many options for study abroad as well, and that's something that we'll touch upon also in the research and involvement series in more detail. And then lastly, I have the Center for Student Involvement, um, which is CSI. Sorry, thank you, Tessa. Um, and then there you'll learn more about student orgs. So student orgs are housed under the Center for Student Involvement. Let's say you get to campus and there's a, there's not a club that exists that you wanna start, the Center for Student Involvement would be your first stop because they have advisors there that can kind of help you with that process. And then also they have community service projects and programs that you can be a part of. So that is also something more to come in the research and involvement series. And next slide. Um, so let's say after all, all the past couple of slides, you're like, I'm interested in research and experiential learning, like now what? So now you can get started on your resume and cover letter and um, join us on August 13th for our resume workshop. You can also attend the research and involvement series next month. Um, our first one starts next Tuesday. And then uh, lastly, you can check in with me the research and involvement coordinator in fall quarter at the Triton Transfer Hub or virtually as well. So we can um, continue to talk about your research and experiential learning opportunities. And next slide and yeah, off to Tessa.
All right, so that's our end of our intro from the Trait and Transfer Hub. Um, I'll go ahead and show this at the very end of our session as well. Um, but we are at our midpoint of this, the quarter of, not that's a quarter, we are at the midpoint of the STEP program, which feels like a quarter, um, but it's just our summer. So um, if you are attending our sessions, we are just hoping to get some feedback for you to see how we can improve this for next year. The winners will be announced in the recap email that is coming out tomorrow. So um, we have some AirPods, UCSD sweatshirts, and hydro flasks. So we really hope you can take the survey. I'll send it out again at the end of the session so that we can um, ensure that everyone has a chance to fill it out. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass over to Diane to share about some of our options for our undocumented students. Awesome, thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Diane Castañeda Munoz and I use she, her pronouns and I am the program manager for undocumented student services here at UC San Diego. So we are a space on campus that supports undocumented students holistically by providing different programs and services to ensure that they're successful while being at UC San Diego. So we provide a variety of services and programs. Um, I won't dive into them today, but if you are an undocumented student interested in learning more about what we do and how we can support you while you're here on campus. We will be presenting on August 5th as part of the STEP program. So if you haven't registered for that and you want to attend, please make sure to do that and we'll dive into all the details of all the programs and services that we have. But today I really just want to touch base on our experiential learning opportunity. So like Elizabeth shared, experiential learning opportunities are really great methods for students on campus to learn by doing. So we created the PACE Fellowship Program because a lot of our undocumented students currently don't have work authorization, especially after all the changes that happened with the DACA program. So we created this program specifically just for students who are California Dream Act recipients to do experiential learning opportunity to ho hopefully be able to get the four things that are mentioned here. So the first thing is obviously professional development. So by engaging in an experiential learning opportunity on campus, students are able to gain hands-on experience. They're also able to get mentorship because um, while you're doing your experiential learning opportunity, you are assigned to a staff member of faculty here at UCSD that's pretty much helping you through that experiential learning opportunity and walking you through it, making sure that the project is going well and if you need any support that you get it from them. Um, then you also get community. Um, there's not that many programs or spaces on campus where you're able to just meet a group of undocumented students that are going through some of the same barriers and struggles that you might be going through at UCSD. It's a really, really great way to make friends and also connect with people that are facing just similar life situations as you. And we also try to do workshops um, when we meet together once a week to ensure that you're getting prepared for anything that's going on, not only on campus, but also outside of campus. Um, so we really try to make sure that you all feel supported in the space and gain a sense of community on campus. And lastly, which is the best part, you get a scholarship and you also get credit for doing this program. So we give you a $7,000 scholarship and you receive academic credit for being part of the PACE Fellowship Program. It is a one-year requirement. Um, and currently we already have closed the applications for current students, but we currently have it open for incoming transfers. So all of you. So if you're interested in being part of the PACE Fellowship Program and you're a California Dream Act recipient, the deadline for incoming transfers is August 9th. We currently have a cohort of 28 students who have already enrolled that are current students. And we're expecting once transfers come in that we will have a cohort of about 50. So that's super exciting. It's gonna be our biggest cohort to date. Um, so if you're interested, definitely apply. The way you can apply is through our website. So I'm just gonna show really quickly our website. You go to our website and then you click programs, PACE Fellowship. It goes through all the details of everything, but then right here where it says PACE application, you click apply here and it'll take you right there. So pretty simple, but if you have any questions, you can always um, email us and our email is also on our website, um, but I also will be staying after this well, actually, I'll be staying for like five more minutes because I do have a meeting after this. But if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box and I will be happy to answer them. Um, but also Elizabeth and Tessa have direct communication with me. So if you ever need any support, you can also ask them and they can refer you back to me. Thank you all so much. Do I pass it over to Ron now?
or Tessa? Yes, Ron will be okay. taking it from here. Mm -hmm. All right then. Here, let me get the share ready. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ron Reyes. I am one of the uh, career advisors uh, here at the Career Center. My official title is a very long one. It's very long-winded, Interim Senior Associate Director, Career Development, Industry Engagement. Um, and I'm currently in a role where I do support a lot of you all. So I support pre-grad, pre-health, graduate, and PhD as a team. Um, and then with my background, um, I, one of my primary populations is healthcare students or pre-health students. Um, so I'm very happy to talk about how do we look at getting experiences and professionalism. This is kind of a plan of the things I'm hoping we can cover. I'm going to go lightning fast, so buckle up. Um, we're going to have a little bit of things to know, ways to get help, um, things to consider. Uh, I put up this slide really quickly just to remind everybody, you have a whole career team uh, here to help you with the things that we're going to be talking about, right? So we're going to be talking about how do I look for employment, gain experience, working on resumes, um, everything that is designed to help you to work professionally, we are able to support here at the Career Center and we want you to visit us. Um, so we have, regardless of what major you are, we have non-STEM, STEM, and then of course, uh, my group being pre-grad and graduate. Um, and then just to give you an idea, uh, it's everything from I need to apply to a grad school or a healthcare profession to I'm a, applying to my first job, right? Um, so those are one-on-one -on -one appointments that we have. We do career fairs throughout the year, tons of professional development series that we uh, market uh, for students to engage with, information sessions uh, from different employers and industries, as well as schools, uh, campus interviewing from employers, as well as a ton of online resources, uh, which I usually have saved in presentations. And if you're curious about that, I'll be making sure to send over the, the resources and information uh, to Tessa so that you guys have that. So jumping into uh, you know, professional considerations uh, for work, right? Uh, so before we really dive into it, I'd like to tell everybody it's good to take be a little reflective right take a quick self inventory what are the things i value what are the things i'm trying to develop are there things i'm really interested or potentially passionate about that i'm going to try and work towards um, and do i have specific goals for myself with the experiences i'm getting and a goal can be simple it could be i need something that works with my schedule that gives me some level of income that i'm going to utilize to develop a skill doesn't have to be ultra specific, right? But you want to know what your priorities are so that as we go into, you know, working and getting experience, we can be thinking about the best way to go about building up our, our profile of understanding and what we want to bring to the table eventually. So if you need help with self-assessment tools, the Career Center actually has quite a few to kind of get an inventory. Um, so uh, we usually say try checking out um, some of the new assessment tools we have. We've also partnered with Career Launch as well. So students who've done that, we can have a bit of a conversation about what, uh, what you're getting out of it. Uh, we also do uh, things like uh, coach you on how do I approach inter um, informational interviews, uh, getting connected to campus resources, right? Um, so we do wanna make sure that you are utilizing these things as we talk about really exploring what you can do for work. Um, now, one thing that I do have to take a pause on and let everybody know is, you know, part of professional development is also personal development, right? Uh, and so some of the things that I try and remind a lot of my students is that, um, you know, part of becoming a good applicant, worker, researcher, future uh, graduate student is building up your personal confidence in what you're doing. Right. Um, and so when we're talking eventually about things like resume and applying to jobs, know that you have skills and know that there are ways to kind of fight the imposter syndrome everybody gets, especially during the first times that they're trying to get experience. Um, so I like to take a quick pause and make sure that, you know, there are things to help kind of fight these little voices that come up when we're talking about job searching. Right. So focus on the things you control. And the things you can control are things like being able to research or look up the places you're applying to, find out a little bit about what they're like, what do they focus on? Is that some place I want to be? You know, take stock in maybe what you, uh, is unique about your experience, and that can be something that you might want to talk about with some of the places you're going to be applying. 
right? Some students like to create a confidence database. What are my key things I'm, I'm good at for myself, right? Uh, you, you can take a, an assessment or inventory at, on the Career Center site, and then you can say, here are some of the natural strengths I have, right? Um, and then besides that, ask for help. You know, it's okay to ask for help. So, you know, these are some things I try and remind everybody as we talk about professional development, getting access to work, finding your first job, um, even if it's just to build experience to the next thing. These are all things you can start very early in the process. So some key strategy tips now that uh, we've taken a moment to think about, okay, self-reflection is part of it. You know, identify what is going to be your motivations and goals, right? Like I want to do X by the end of the quarter or by the end of the year. That's a good place to start. You know, is there specific types of experience that you feel is going to be helpful for you to decide if you like something or not, right? Uh, if I really want to continue into graduate school, do I want to try and apply for a research experience so I could see if I like research enough for that to be the majority of what I focus on? Or maybe I'm going to look at a part-time job um, with a specific type of professional so I could see if that's something that interests me. Um, and then, you know, as you are looking, start to assess where can I build relationships and networks that put me in places where I get to interact with those who are doing the work I'm interested in, right? So building network and then being open to seeking opportunities wherever you find them. So uh, some things that we think about in the job search or just work in general is, you know, what can you do to identify what are some opportunities? right? Like the, the, the big strategy thinking. So one, visit us. We will talk through any of your interests if you want. Um, but sometimes it's just as simple as telling the people around you, I'm looking at X. Does anybody know anyone that I should talk to, right? Friends and family will sometimes still point you in a direction, show up to our fairs. Fairs are great to find out who's hiring, who's tabling. They have a relationship with UCSD students. Ask them questions. Um, you can schedule inter informational interviews a lot of times, whether it's meeting somebody at the fair and then following up with them, you know, if you got their business card, uh, to looking people up on networks like LinkedIn and Triton's Connect, um, which are platforms that give you access to people that you can ask to have an informal conversation about the work that they do, right? Uh, the other thing that I think a lot of students don't realize is there's a ton of resources for you to network on campus. You can join a different professional sessions. You can see what groups on campus are pursuing either areas of study or uh, professions or interests that are in line with some of your professional goals. Uh, and then there's always faculty and staff. Um, if there's any faculty or staff that have a background or background understanding of the areas you're interested in, ask them questions. Most of us are happy to tell you, you know, what we know about the things that we focus our professional career on. Um, so don't miss out on that. It's always okay to ask. I'd love to know more about what you do, right? So those are kind of uh, some initial strategies that I like to go over and highly encourage, right? So now that we know the strategy of exploring and searching, the next thing to think about is, okay, what, in the th what are the things I should probably start working on? I should probably start working on a resume. I should know that I'm at some of the positions I'm applying for, I'm gonna need a cover letter. Uh, I should also think about maybe getting a LinkedIn profile, because that is one of the largest networking platforms for people trying to get early work. Um, if I'm really interested in specific industries, I have a lot of pre-health students, and I always say, find out what are the big topics in healthcare right now. That's huge. Um, or say I'm interested in social sciences and going further in that, well, politics right now is huge. Educational policy is big. There's a lot of different things going on uh, in current news and trends that is helpful for you to make decisions about places you might wanna apply to or get experience with, right? Um, look for uh, maybe advice from specific departments. And then of course, I'm gonna be going over today some quick tips on looking at Handshake um, as kind of one of the central platforms for students. So before we talk and look at opportunities, I just want to create a quick clarification because some things are new. Um, one of the things that uh, we've started to notice is students kind of looking at what are my internship opportunities for experience, right? So we'll have internships and the new thing, micro internships. So micro internships are 
um, an interesting and newer development for students as of the, I would say, the last couple of years. So I want to just touch on that as you look for opportunities. So real quickly, traditional internships, month to a year lo long. Uh, typically, it's uh, either part-time or full-time opportunities, depending on when it's scheduled. It covers a broad range of industries. It could be paid, unpaid, stipend, course credit. Um, it's usually either... Uh, it could actually be anything from remote to in-person. Um, and then there, it, the idea is it gives you a, lo a longer term experience with an organization group or industry. Micro internships, which we have partnered with a, a service called Parker Dewey that puts them all together for you guys, um, are short. So they could be a week long, they could maybe be a month long, but they are designed to be short project based uh, experiences that you sign up for. So they might have a research task or they might have um, a coding task. Um, it's things that you can execute in a short period of time that count as consultant work. Um, they're paid a lot of times, especially with Parker Dewey, with pays about 300 for a short project, sometimes more. Um, and it's, the idea is this something that is flexible, that gives you something to try out and test, right? So this is very trial or prototyping different types of work. Um, so I like to put that out there since it's a new shiny thing that students have access to, is actually trying out these little things as you go, especially if with a busy schedule, you might not be able to commit to uh, a standard internship. Uh, I know you, they've already mentioned LAPE, uh, LAPE Learning Aligned Employment Program. You, I always say just use that as a LAEP, as a search engine when you are looking in Handshake to see if it does count as a LAPE um, opportunity. And really the idea is, is, is short-term research opportunities that are funded so that you get paid for research. Um, I just like to make sure to call it out because when we're going to be talking about job search, that might be a filter if you are eligible. And so some of the different job sites that a lot of students like to look at, uh, Handshake is the one for students. It's how you schedule appointments with the Career Center. It's also how you look at career fairs uh, and job postings that are targeting college level students. Um, LinkedIn, great professional profile. Also jobs, USA Jobs. You can use Google, Google is fine. ZipRecruiter, Indeed. So there's a lot of different ways you can start searching. Uh, for this presentation, I'm just going to touch on Handshake and maybe talk about a couple of strategies. So real quickly, um, you should have access hopefully by now to Handshake. And when you're logged in, all you have to do is click on jobs and you will get pulled into uh, different search filters. So this is where I mentioned key terms like late might be helpful um, because you can actually put that in the search button alongside any sort of titles that you might be interested in, right? I have some students that will search health sciences or um, I had another one that was looking at any sort of coordinator position. Um, and so you can put these various things that you might be eligible for or that is in line with your search uh, in Handshake at the jobs that you're looking for. And so once you find a job and it pops up, you can kind of go through and see if it's something you wanna do. I usually just uh, highlight and this, of course, is an old example. So this job is currently not posted, but uh, I always like to highlight some key areas, right? Like pay attention to uh, when is the deadline for this application. If it's close to the deadline, be careful, right? Uh, get it in ASAP. Uh, estimated uh, salary, um, actually uh, student pay has gone up, uh, but you can see the estimated salary for that position. And then I would start looking at uh, terms of employment. So I'm looking at location. Uh, I'm looking at if there's any additional qualifiers I should pay attention to. So like, for example, this one um, is you must be an enrolled student. And the way they say enrolled student is basically you must pay UC San Diego service fees each quarter working. Um, so that's kind of uh, some of the, the things I look at uh, in addition to you know, the basics, like how many hours a week am I expected to do this thing? And then when are they planning to start up? Um, some of the positions I will say uh, can start quicker than expected. So keep in mind, keep an eye out on a desired start date versus deadline. Um, sometimes they'll keep an application open, but they'll start hiring for multiple positions. Um, so just always do your homework as you're looking through jobs. Um, and when you're submitting, it's usually straightforward. They'll ask you things like attaching a resume. If there's additional documents, I would recommend a cover letter. Some positions will also ask if it's 
during a school year, maybe if you can upload a general idea of what your schedule might be so they can figure out um, how many students they may need to hire to get coverage at a site, right? So these are additional documents that might be considered. Oops. So those are some things that I would say get you started. And of course, as you're looking at job postings, if you're not sure, please do drop in hours. We have drop in hours where you can come in and say, I'm looking at this job. I have a resume. Yeah, let's be strategic about what I'm putting on here to be a better candidate for this thing I'm applying for, whether it's in Handshake or another profile. Real quickly, I'm going to touch on work study. Um, so work study is basically federal funding. You fill out your FAFSA uh, like you normally do for any student looking at federal aid. If you are eligible and you filled out all your documents and you're a matriculated student, you'll get you'll find out if you're eligible and they'll send you a letter with what does that look like and you can talk to financial services about your eligibility. Um, work study typically applies to part-time employment. So, uh, you know, once you you uh, are eligible for work study. Uh, it's basically apply to a job that's work study eligible. You'll probably go through the standard interview process. Um, if they don't specifically call out that it's work study, you can ask or mention in interview that you are a work study student just so that they are aware if it's not already built into the uh, job posting. And then once, uh, you know, assuming that you make it through the interview process, it's a process that the uh, supervisor and that department We'll work with financial services to make sure that um, if it's a work study position, they'll document that. So you don't have to worry about all that. Just apply. If they like you, they'll hire you. And then that department will work with uh, financial services and student employment to make sure that they're using your work study for it. Some big tips. Uh, these are things that are awarded but not guaranteed, right? So you have, it's use it or lose it essentially, and that you wanna make sure that if you are eligible, why not apply, right? Um, you know, the other thing is that sometimes there is um, work study positions that aren't on campus. So that's why I said, please make sure to check the location. Um, it might be slightly off campus or with a campus partner. Um, so you wanna be aware of that. It's not applied directly to your tuition, uh, which means that it's an actual paycheck. Um, which is great for students because sometimes they're worried that, you know, I could be doing this work but not actually get to use the money that I'm earning. No, it's an actual paycheck that you receive. Um, I believe the hourly is, is minimum is at about 1630, but it has gone up. Um, and then work hours should not exceed typically 19.5 hours a week. And that's just to ensure that you are spending most of your time as a student being a student. We don't want you to spend or overwork. Um, and therefore not have uh, the ability to perform as well academically. And then last things to, oh wait, oh, that's a repeat. There we go. So the things about uh, applying and employment that I try and remind everybody, give yourself grace. It's a process, okay? So we find an employment and work. This is a learning process. We apply, we put ourselves out there. Once we put ourselves out there, Hopefully we will land one of our first positions. It might not be ideal, but it's work, right? And then you build up some experiences, you get skills. We update your resume with those experiences and skills and you do it all over again. Um, so I like to remind students, don't beat yourself up as you are starting this process because it's an ongoing process to build and work towards getting experience and then eventually entering full-time work. All right, so with that, Let's see how am I doing on time. Um, I'm going to just go over if my computer doesn't freeze. Oh, I think it froze. No. So on average, how long does it take to make an initial impression when we're networking? Seven seconds. So the reason why I touch on networking very quickly is when you are looking at employment opportunities, a lot of times networking can be the way that you get access to employment. It's the way you can get referrals. It's the way you can find out about positions or opportunities that are available to you. Um, so it's a way of building uh, something that will help you in the long run, right? Your contacts, people that you keep up with. Um, so knowledge sharing is key. And I'll say anecdotally, a lot of people uh, start off with a simple job and then maybe their uh, manager or supervisor becomes a referral for them to the next job that they do. 
right? So networking is key uh, for kind of putting yourself out there and getting the job. Um, and a lot of times we'll say, you know, a lot of our students will find out maybe about 50% uh, of the work opportunities out there end up because you in some way, shape or form, you are willing to ask a question or have an extra conversation with a professional. Um, so we wanna just make sure that you mentally prepare for that as you are looking for jobs and employment. So be yourself, know what you're good at, be prepared to network with people, show interest and make sure to follow up with those that are offering help, right? Um, these are all networking basics, but it'll also help you with landing uh, new opportunities as you start working and getting your feet wet. Uh, Tessa, how are we doing on time? We are ahead of time. We got um, 10 minutes to go before Q&A time is scheduled, but- Perfect. Awesome. I just making sure I have some time. Um, so uh, with that, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you really leverage the relationships that you're going to be building. Okay. So I like to think about networking, professional development as an ongoing construction project. It's never done but it, you can start somewhere, right? So your foundation or uh, your blueprint really is starting to do your homework, right? So check out what events are available to network. Uh, so there's events in Handshake, there's events in student orgs. Transfer Hub has a ton of opportunities for you to network, utilize all of it, right? So first, uh, first part of your kind of blueprint to everything is, know what's out there and it show up, right? That's the easiest thing you can do, just show up and ask questions and interact with people. From there, make a decision, right? Where do I wanna position myself? Who do I want to continue to develop professional relationships with, network with, affiliate with? You know, it could be a student org, it could be um, you know, different workshops and events, uh, but find ways to join groups that make sense for what you wanna do. A lot of my students join certain student orgs because at least you have one shared interest or one shared professional goal, right? Um, and that helps you not only expand your network, but have like-minded people who can help refer you out to the places you need to go and what you want to do. And then once you know what the networks are, where to go, whether it's LinkedIn, Tritons Connect, um, looking at different organizational events, get used to asking, can I have a conversation? Right. Um, it, it can be as informal as I'd love to pick your brain for five minutes about how you got into your position to an, uh, to an informational interview where you're you're asking somebody, can I spend some time learning how you got to that position? Right. Um, so these are all important things because it doesn't necessarily lead to a job right away. But what it does lead to is a higher probability of you getting access to a lot more opportunities, whether it's on or off campus. So I have to mention it, if we're talking job search, if we're talking professional development, networking is essential for you to have a very sustainable um, access to these types of resources. So real quickly, because I've gotten this question multiple times, what should I expect or do, oops, for inter informational interviews? So, not much. It's really simple, guys. It's just, can I have a conversation with you about what you're doing? Um, and usually it starts off with finding something you, you have in common or that uh, brings you to them, right? So let's just say I am looking at uh, a biotech research because I want to break into it. And I notice one of the faculty members happens to ha or have had previous work with, say, Moderna or Illumina or one of the other biotech companies uh, when it comes to drug development. It could be simple as, hi, I, had I didn't realize not only were you X professor, but you were also one of the people in X project on this research. I'd love to know more about that. That's actually an area I'm really fascinated by. That's it. Can I have a conversation, right? Um, so, you know, the reason why we hope you guys do these things is because it's a way for you to expand your network very quickly. And more often than not, people don't mind a casual conversation, right? Uh, it's not a job interview. Uh, it's, you're not asking for anything other than a little bit of their time. 
So, you know, I always like to put that. And if it's a professional that really likes you and really gets along and you kind of understand each other, they might generate referrals of, you know, who else you should talk to? I have a colleague in this other department that actually has some openings coming up in the summer. Maybe you should talk to them about what they're doing, right? That happens a lot of times for students if you're willing to ask an extra question. So when introducing yourself, I like to say uh, there's the pitch or elevator pitch. For those who don't know what it is, very simple. It's uh, the picture of yourself in an elevator and somebody very interesting or in the field that you want to uh, ask questions about is in the same elevator with you and you have maybe three floors before they head out, right? What can you tell them about yourself and in, uh, in that short period of time, right? Very simple. Um, you don't have to include your whole life story in 30 seconds. That's not the point. It's just give me a little snippet so I can understand and potentially connect with you. So introduce yourself, maybe share something interesting or purposeful for why you might want to strike up a conversation, maybe provide something of interest. If we're at a conference, then maybe you might provide skills or a project you're working on and then ask them if um, about either what they do or if um, you know who this person is, maybe ask them about uh, what you're interested in, right? So that's a basic format for a pitch. Um, and then a lot of times when we start talking about like, let's just say employers, uh, like I'm at a fair and I see an employer, maybe I could say, hi, my name is Ron. I'm a Ravel student. I'm a second year in biology. I'm really interested in your company because I noticed last quarter you you posted a job posting for this type of position. I would love to know if you have another one coming up in the next quarter or month, right? You, that then that's it. Right. You just got a very basic like I noticed you had this position and this project. I want to ask you questions. Right. And that's simple enough to actually get the conversation going. So with that, really network everywhere. Everything you do is a opportunity to network. Being in this program, opportunity to network with the other students in it, uh, being uh, able to show up to different places uh, and ask questions is an opportunity to network. Um, so you never know where your next opportunity is unless you're open to having an extra question, having an extra conversation, seeing what groups are out there and who's around you. Right. Um, so I like to put that out there because a lot of times people are like, I have no one I can talk to. I'm like, are you on campus? Do you share a class with someone? Do you have a hallmate that you actually get along with? You know, there's a ton of different ways for you to network and it doesn't all have to be academic for it to be purposeful. Right. Um, so I just like to put that out there uh, because a lot of people actually have a lot more ways to network than they think. And then, like I mentioned before, the networking platforms that I see a lot of students utilize. So there's two, um, Triton's Connect. So that's UCSD student and alum. So if you're looking for a low hanging fruit guys, uh, Triton's Connect have alumni that literally put a little, little button on them that's uh, open to chatting, right? And they're in a ton of different professions. So that's a great way to have an informational interview or an informal conversation with an alumni in a profession who's open to chatting about how they got there, right? So that's a really good one for you guys to get started. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned before, um, say you were curious uh, about alumni at UC San Diego as a whole on the professional networks, LinkedIn actually has an alumni button where you can see who are there or who's there that is an alumni. And then on top of that, you can even do additional searches and filters to find out you know, specific job titles or industries. So like, for example, I had somebody do a search on who are all the clinical coordinators at UCSD Health who also happen to be alumni because they were hoping to find out how could they work towards getting a clinical coordinator position as far, far as maybe work for a junior or senior um, in the upcoming year. So you don't have to do the reach out, uh, but I want to give plenty of time to see what kind of questions that we have. Um, or what kind of advice or information students need when it comes to anything I mentioned. Let's see here. Thank you so much, Ron. Yeah. One thing I'll just clarify as you maybe look through some of the questions we've had and as more questions come in, um, we had a lot of folks centering around work study. Mm -hmm. And something um, I think is always worth clarifying is that work study is a, a portion of FAFSA. It's a, per, a portion of your financial aid that's gifted to you. 
So it says that instead of taking a loan and paying interest on that loan, you're working and in turn, the university will pay you in what just looks like a regular university paycheck to you. Um, but that's a, a type of financial aid. So that's something that as you applied for FAFSA, if you're a US citizen and FAFSA eligible, that's how that comes to you, just in terms of a paycheck. But UCSD has so many other opportunities and internships and fellowships that are not associated with work study, where you might see that some um, of the jobs listed on Handshake are work study preferred is because like for me, I hire students. Um, and what that means is if I hire someone who's work study, I'm getting a 60 or 70% discount on my paycheck for that person. So that's why you might see that there's some preference because some of that's getting paid um, from the other side, but that doesn't mean that it's only open for work study students. So um, for my work study student versus my non-work study student, on your side, it looks exactly the same. You're just getting uh, a paycheck from the university, but it looks a little bit different on the employer side. So that's just a clarification. I'm seeing a lot of work study questions specifically, but for work study, that's kind of the, the overview. And if you don't have it, you're still very hireable. Yeah, the uh, work study, again, is a benefit. It's not necessarily um, a requirement for a lot of the positions out there. Um, I always like to mention it, though, just because we do have a high population of work study eligible students um, in general at UCSD. So it's good just to be aware if you are one of those eligible students, you can even do a, a quick filter to kind of find out about that um, if you want to if you're trying to target utilizing that benefit. Yeah, um, let's see. Q&A. Is it possible to find research opportunities and jobs after the first quarter when we should look for opportunities uh, later? Uh, should uh, When should we look for opportunities later in the year? I will say some things, and Elizabeth, you might have some other things you want to add. Uh, my first thing I always tell everybody with research in general, there are always opportunities, and it doesn't necessarily matter what year you are or how far along in your academic career you're in. I will say, however, that being said, and getting access does not mean it's always the best time for that particular person, right? You might have other things you want to juggle, and some research opportunities are a lot more demanding than others, right? So it should always be more of a question of, if I'm interested in doing that opportunity, am I good fitting it in with the schedule that I have? And if I am, what's my strategy and game plan for that? Um, but, you know, there's opportunities year round at every academic level. My um, also two cents on the research opportunities and jobs portion too is um, I know, right, as you can first students, your first quarter want to get used to environment, campus, classes and stuff. So definitely understandable if you want to take the first quarter to just adjust to everything. Um, with that being said, I think it's also good and, and it's good that you're here too, right, at this session. And if you um, also do the research and involvement series, it's good to at least be aware of deadlines, upcoming deadlines for maybe research programs, um, maybe deadlines for like a job or something like that. Um, right, because let's say you know about, um, you know, applying to UCDC and you're like, oh, if I want to apply for the summer, I have to make sure I get the deadline in winter. So that's like one one example. Right. So if you're aware of like the type of opportunities now and all of you are here, I think that's a good sign. Um, but to answer your question, yes, it's possible to do research after like your first quarter um, here at UCSD. Right. Um, after their first quarter, let's say you've acclimated and we can always talk about, you know, what research opportunities you can do. Um, for example, the trails program, there's a spring one and you can do it in summer. So definitely there will be opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think this one was already answered, but uh, work study paychecks go to you, not your tuition. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was covered. Um, are all the jobs and companies listed on Handshake credible? I will say by and large, uh, majority of them should be solid companies that have done some level of work to get vetted. I will say, if you do come across anybody that is acting in any way, shape, or form potentially suspicious or that um, makes you feel like it, there's something about the process that doesn't sound quite right, immediately let us know. 
Very rarely does it come up, but if there is a company like that, we will actually take actions to make sure that you guys are safe and taken care of. So always, 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 if there even seems to be a question about it, please let us know. More often than not, we can help make sure that it is still correct. Um, there's only maybe been once in two years that I see a company where it'd be kind of questionable whether or not we would want to recommend somebody applying to it. And we'd actually put a request to remove them from the R database if it's something of a concern. Let's see. And then I saw... How hard is it for an international student to get a job on campus? It's really not necessarily a question of whether it's hard or not, is just depending on your international status, you have a limit to how many hours you can do, right? Um, so I've, I mean, I've, I have a graduate student right now who is an international student that's working 19.5 hours monthly uh, without any issue. Um, so it's not really a matter of it being hard, it's just making sure that you're not um, going past any expectations or limits based off of your status um, and making sure to communicate with offices like ISPO to make sure you're doing all, all you, know, you know about what, where you are with your hours. All right, let's see. There's a question about study abroad. Mm -hmm. um, the study abroad programs, they vary from deadline to deadline. Um, and like I touched on a little bit earlier, sometimes you can do it a study abroad program for research. Sometimes it's to take um, courses for your major. Sometimes it's to learn a language. Um, so I wouldn't say it's um, the difficulty to get accepted. It's finding the right program that suits like your needs and your timeline as well. So that's my piece of advice. And also going to um, the study abroad website too, if you wanna you know, get started on browsing what type of programs are offered there, I would um, highly recommend that too. Yeah. Most camp, I'll answer just for, for um most campus positions are more than the San Diego minimum wage. Um, our student, there's different student um, ranges. I'll say one of the highest paying jobs on campus, which is always surprising, is transportation, is driving the buses around mm -hmm. campus, and they'll pay for you to get your, your C license. Um, but um, UCSD does pay their student, our student workers a pretty fair wage, I would say. I would say comfortably it's uh, like, for example, even in food service, food service tends to be higher than food service outside of UCSD. Um, so all the positions from what I can tell, at least based off of postings and, and looking at it are actually fairly, fairly good for a student, you know, understanding that it is part-time position and it's on campus. Um, all right. So I saw one is, um, what is the limit of hours weekly for international students? I believe in general, it stays in line with the 19.5, but I would always double check with ISPO to see if there's any other considerations depending on the time of year. Um, and then I noticed there was a question about, um, you know, being in an honors program and uh, the workload potentially being intensive. Um, and so there you were wondering if uh, experiential learning uh, or if you should still consider experiential learning or doing things outside the classroom, um, such, uh, such as research or other internships that aren't related to what you are doing. My first answer is get your bearings. <laughs> get your bearings, make sure you can handle what you can handle. And if you feel like it's something you want to dip your toes into, dip your toes into after you get your bearings, right? Um, honors programs uh, can be very intensive in workload. Um, so we never want to say, don't do it or do it, but don't do anything else. Really get a feel for what you can achieve and what you're comfortable with, and then see if you can work it in because sometimes students will work that in or they'll just wait till the summer right um there are summer opportunities as well so there are different ways you can go about it depending on workload and the pacing that you're comfortable with where can you find a list of campus jobs all of handshake <laughs> you can just go to handshake 
uh, and there should be a filter for on campus and then that will just post uh, that will just filter all the current campus positions that are there for you. Um, and that's probably one of the easier ways to find most of the campus position jobs, since our student employment office primarily posts through Handshake. And then, of course, there's also the real portal for research specific opportunities um, that you can also look and see if they have on campus uh, opportunities there. All right. Any other? Oh, let's see. You can still check for positions even over the summer. Um, sometimes, like I'll give you an example. I have student positions where we will do online virtual training for our summer hires to prep them for fall start. Um, so even in the summer, we do have positions that are geared towards students. There might not be as many midsummer, but it starts to uptick because a lot of us need lead in time to actually train you before summer or before the fall quarter hits and we need you to hit the ground running. Um, so like even at the career center, we have career peer educator positions that are live over the summer for submission. And then we try and figure out when we can hire them so we can get them through the HR process and then immediately train them before the quarter starts. So I would still be looking at summer opportunities if you're interested. Perfect. And we are at our four o'clock time. Um, I did see a really good question come in that said, um, when are students, incoming transfer students eligible to meet with a career advisor? Are they already able to do that now that they have um, Handshake or do they need to wait for classes to start? You can technically have an appointment early. That's fine. Just make sure to, uh, we don't do academic advisement. So it's no academic questions. But if you're like, I'm just looking at putting my resume together or coming up with a game plan about what I want to do, perfectly fine. Perfect. Um, as it is um, time, I'm going to go ahead and just share our, my screen one more time um, with our midpoint survey link. This is closing tonight at midnight. So if you want to fill out the survey, it's your last few hours to be able to do so. Um, and then I can keep the zoom open for a couple more minutes if folks are able to answer questions or else I can close it out. Um, but I'll, I'll leave this up here. So we have the link to the survey and we have our QR code. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, with it being four, I'll go ahead and stop our recording, but we can, um, answer a few questions for folks if they're still popping in.